people forget we were the last team to put out Iggy's Warriors before they went on that run. Like we were one of the last teams to actually do well. I, I always say y'all y'all should at least won one chip. Just one, bro. Just one, right? At if least we got one chip. Yeah. Bro, if you look back, we had every single piece you needed at different points, but we weren't mentally tough. And that's where you guys had the advantage and you guys were more together. And I think you saw we weren't together at times when adversity hit. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Point Forward Podcast. I'm Andre Godala. Being joined by my guy, Evan Turner. Yo, yo. Before we get started, make sure you subscribe and follow us everywhere you get to listen to your podcasts. And make sure you follow us on all social platforms at Point Forward. Point Forward. On today's show, we are discussing the NCAA tournament and the new landscape that has adjusted the level of competition. Our thoughts on the NBA's decision to shut down the G League Ignite. We also will have Mr. Six Man himself, Jamal Crawford. Point forward. RDT, March Madness, the upsets have been happening uh, throughout the tourney. And uh, I think we've been talking about this for quite some time, even speaking about my son and who he's, who his competition is or who it should be. And I think the upsets reflect the deeper changes in the college landscape where uh, the volatile nature of college sports has reached a point where um, a surprising upsets in March Madness isn't simply a setback, but how it can trigger a profound questioning about roster management, financial sustainability, and adapting to this new competitive landscape. And it's all broken down here, this quote with John Calipari, where he says, it's changed on us. All of a sudden, the sport has gotten really old. So we're playing teams that are average age is 19 as Kentucky, and their average age is 24 or 25. So do I change because of that? And I was having some conversations with um, with one of our guys in the last year or two and how Penny Hardaway started changing the way he recruited. And so instead of going out and getting, you know, the high school phenoms, the Mikey Williams and, you know, the hot bid for the high school talent, they're starting to get to go to the portal and getting guys who are are much older, who have an understanding of basketball, more mature, stronger, you know, just the whole gamut, just better in terms of where they're at now. Like you're Tyler Hansborough as a fifth year senior now. You yeah. know what I mean? And at the same time, I think one thing that occurs that you can't trump is experience and like mm-hmm. what you're able to make up for. You know, uh, I think one thing that that's an underrated thing is. In the NBA, we work really hard. Don't get it wrong, but that's a choice. In, a, in college, you kind of orchestrated, taught, and put on a guideline to really, you know, before if guys on transfer kind of run a system. So an 18 year old mm-hmm. coming in as a freshman, going up against a guy that's been in college for five years and 24 years old. Just speaking about the, you know, the physical, you know, advantage they have as is the experience to really, you know, compete is crazy. You look at the game when Oakland beat Kentucky. Mm-hmm. You know, Oakland basically only had one true freshman. I think they had like four or five, uh, you know, graduate seniors. And, you know, what I mean, guys from the transfer portal compared to, you know, Kentucky, although they had great players, but they had eight freshmen, three sophomores, basically. That's the roster. And that's the roster. And I think it comes down to this one thing that occurs is uh, you see it in league sometimes but when uh, Rob Dillingham hit the game, when, uh, hit the, the three to put them down by one. And then he did a rookie mm-hmm. move where he left, you know, strong side Ball corner, side corner that you should yep. never do. And that's not something that occurs. It's just still teaching that that should be like implemented into your body. We're just like, no, I don't need this ever. That type of little experiences and those little flaws or little things you count on, especially in a tournament, it all comes mm-hmm. down to the little things. And, um, hey, bro, the play 24 year olds, bro, those are, that's pro level. And that gap and that difference is, is everything. So I, I don't know. I think one thing that, um, you know, Jay Wright said was like the era, he said the era taking these young freshmen and trying to play against older players is over. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's just, you really have to, if you care about your job and you care about the NIL situation kind of set up, you got to go, you know, you might have to go get some, uh, some older guys. I remember Thad Mata said, if, 
before all this happened, he's like, if you want to win a national champion, if you want to go to Final Four, have juniors and seniors on your team. If you want to win a national title, have pros. But now it seems like you want to win a national title, you have 24-year-olds that are technically supposed to be pros. <laughs> and that's that's going to get you over the hump every single time. You know? And it's almost setting like, like a minor leagues, you know, for guys who know they may not be able to go pro, but can take advantage of getting an extra year eligibility. And that's what's interesting to me, you know, because if you're a coach, ET, how are you recruiting players? And what do you think of the portal? Because this is what I ask myself. You know, if I do four years, maybe even five years of college, what's the point of me going back, transferring and going to play an extra year, knowing that, you know, I'm not going pro. But, but I'm just I'm just trying to be devil's advocate. Like, yeah. I, I what is think, that? What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, well, certain dudes just want to play somewhere. I think some of the guys are like, man, this might still give me an opportunity to be put on a big platform. And then also, too, you can't knock the NIL, you know? If you come back for the fifth years, I always say this a lot. Like, a lot of those guys in the NIL, some of the top players, are, are going to make more this year than they may make the next three years combined. You know what I mean? You got guys making 400000 500000 that was, you know, beloved in college, and now they might go overseas and might get lucky and make one twenty. You know, so I think when it comes down to a business decision, just like what the, the female players said, like, you know, Angel Reese and everything, like, man, it pays to stay here and, you know, to be better off to stay here and go where you're loved and kind of, you know, where your name, image, and likeness is everything. Much more than when you get to the pros, it's like, man, you damn near, even if you want the best, they don't want to pay you. No, this is, you're 100% right. And I think it's going to come to a point where we're asking, what is the NCAA? What 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 is NCAA athletics? I think it's going to come down to that. Yeah. And and, and when you break, it has to come down to that because now we're getting to the point where there, there was no longer about the school and kind of trying to, uh, you know, build reps or like build a connect is really just becoming a money thing because now you're seeing so many players. I think Coach Larry Nega, uh, you know, Jay's dad was saying there's 4,000 players in college basketball and 2,000 into the portal every year. So, like, how do you build any type of teaching? How do you build any type of, you know, familiarity? But then at the same time, half these people are asked for six figures to play the game. It's just unrealistic. So now when you're coming down to it, it's like now we're looking for our boosters to be able to, you know, put money into, you know, these players' pockets all while we just talked last week. The NCAA mm-hmm. is bringing in how much per per year? 500, 600 million. You know what I mean? And it's a, it's a free agency of uh amateur sports <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah it's, <laughs> how about that for a contradiction yeah it's like selling, <laughs> it's like trying to sell back some used case swisses <laughs> it's like no nah, but i want 400 dollars for these it's like man no nah. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean other than that besides that i think one thing that occurs uh just to play devil's advocate it has to make it for very good games and america loves cinderella teams and when you balance out the level of uh the advantages certain players from Kentucky get. Like, I mean, you've been a Wildcat Lodge. You've been a Rupp Arena. Like, those dudes have been on crazy platforms compared to uh, some underdogs that, you know, that might have been the biggest stage to compete on. So I think there's a way to balance out the playing field, but, you know, I, I, it, it's still yet to be seen. Yeah, but I, one thing I want to ask you, and I've been thinking about this all week, is that I'm seeing a lot of noise come from the women's game is getting better viewership in the men's game and i keep hearing the women's is take the women are taking over the women are taking over which you know i'm perfectly fine with that but how do i state it can't be expressed vice versa yeah I, part of the issue is there's no familiarity within the men's game because of the way the transfer porter is set up in the men's game i yeah. should say yeah and so the product is affected so all those things i've been thinking about this this past week no, that's real. And I, I guess one thing that is occurring is so tough in so many forms that are able to get that, you know, recognition is you have to compare it to something. And then when you compare it, it's like, nah, like it's 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 being watched more than like the women's game or uh, the men's the women's term is being watched more than men's. Well, I mean that that means y'all just super turned up. Like if a bajillion people are watching us and a double bajillion people watching y'all. It's just good product. You know what I mean? Yes. I think it's like when um yes. 
when Soldier Boy attacked Nas for saying hip hop dead, it's like it's all about how you view it. If it wasn't as good as it was back in the day, say that then. But right now, people are eating, turned up, and they're still great out. During that time, my dark twisted fantasy was invented. Why should Thrones invent it? And I, I don't know. I, I just think it's just obviously you have to draw from something and some type of comparison, and you know you want to mm-hmm. see the value, and, and and you have to give them a grace period to be able to say that and be able to uh, celebrate that. Because five, even five years ago, that sounded crazy. You know what I mean? No, no, that was perfect. Yeah. Perfect how you just stated that. Because my thing is same as yours. Like, why can't we just say? the women's game is leading the charge right now. It's yeah. a much better way to express it and bring shed more light to them and what they're doing as opposed to the comparing them. Because I think that's what we're all trying to get away from is the comparisons. Yeah, and, and you know, because the ugliest moment that occurred in respect to Harrison Barnes is like when somebody brought up his name talking about, I only get paid this and I'm a da 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 And Harrison Barnes right. made 90. And it's like, bro, that, that backhanded disrespect or like those backhanded compliments is not player- it's not P. And if somebody reached a limit and been like, can you just please shut the fuck up and spoke the truth, then then it would crumble everything. So yeah. let's get up out of here. Message. Message. Point. Forward. Speaking of March Madness, over 63,000 of you entered the Point Forward Men's College Bracket Challenge presented by DraftKings. With $25,000 prize pool online, how are our brackets looking after all the upsets? Shout out to the person in first, Oldman42, with 570 points and 1K in prizes so far. Okay, you turned up. That's a lot of entries. That's like, a lot. I, 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 that's a lot. When I, I saw that, I'm like, damn. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I thought DraftKings was about to be mad and be like, man, come on, bro. 47 niggas entered. <laughs> I was like, man, we're going to do this. But it lets me know there's some real degenerates out there. <laughs> check it if, ain't uh, our influence. <laughs> yeah, check, check if uh, Jante uh, Porter <laughs> enter. Let me see how many how many uh, brackets he filled out. Actually, they have Houston right behind. Pause. A plus five hundred, right? Yes, sir. Then they have Purdue in third at a plus six fifty, and then your alma mater, Dre, Arizona, plus yeah. nine hundred. And I'm actually. I'm not mad at Arizona winning, G. I think we're looking good. I think they got a real chance. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. Besides uh, UConn, I just like the guard play. Y'all got some pretty good wings. And uh, if we get to the Final Four, I like our chances. We we love to lose to teams we should beat, and but we always beat the teams that are in our realm or rank just above us. We lost our we lost to Purdue this year, so that was a good for us, a good test for us. Um, so. I won't be mad at that matchup uh, if if it, if it comes together. But we we got we got one really really big game coming up versus Clemson. Clemson's good, and uh, Caleb Caleb Love he played against them coming from Carolina, yeah. so uh, he's going to put the proper respect on them uh, with the focus come come this Thursday, and then uh, Saturday it'd be a really good game, and then possibly being in Phoenix next week. We'll see. Yeah, that'd be lit. I um that would be crazy. I got, I'm about to put a stack on North Carolina State, to be honest with you. For all my guys that are really, you know what I mean, banking on a, the lottery, mm-hmm. and they got, they down in their last stack, join me at the betting office <laughs> and put a thousand on a wolf pack for the first time ever since uh, Jimmy V coached, okay? They weren't being, they weren't being favored back then. Shout out Jimmy V. Shout out to Derek Burns Jr., the vending machine owner. That's some good odds, plus 9,000. I like that. Point forward. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here, and DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn five bucks into one hundred and fifty dollars instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code Point Forward. New customers can bet five bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code point four. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 8778-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit cpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. One no sweat bet per new customer. Issued as one bonus bet on amount of initial losing bet. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash bomos for deposit, wagering, and eligibility restrictions, terms, and responsible gambling resources. 
Point Forward is sponsored by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Point Forward. And so um, we have some interesting topics around uh, gambling and college basketball. And it leads us to, you know, NIL, which I think plays a part in here. And the NBA is to shut down the G League Ignite team after this season, reports spoke to. And and so uh, NBA has decided to discontinue the G League Ignite team following this season, bringing it into the development mental program for top draft prospects and experienced players, which was established in 2020. So it's only been four years. Now, one thing I do respect about this, and then I, you know, I get this quote from uh, Adam Silver. I'm not sure what the future of Team Ignite will be because before I felt there was a hole in the marketplace we were filling. Now my focus is turning to earlier development of those players. So uh, I think that speaks to where the NBA is headed next. I mean, he just basically spoke towards they want to start the relationship or the familiarity with players at an earlier age. I know the Nike has a EYBL a high school circuit, uh, which is in season, not just the summer now. And so they're full year. And so maybe there's something there with Nike being a um, partner. Uh, of the NBA and NBPA as the profi- official jersey provider. And this isn't me speaking some inside information. I do not know. I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's a bunch of a bunch of kids came from the G League Ignite. Uh, Kaminga, uh, Jalen Green, Scoot Henderson, uh, Dyson Daniel, who's in New Orleans right now yeah. doing this thing. And they and got two, uh, a- two projected top, uh, draft picks in Ryan Highland. They're supposed to be lottery picks. Some, some have them top five. And Matas. Matis Buzelis. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, I think uh, Scoot Henderson, the latest <laughs> draft pick, said about the night, he said they don't really get enough credit for how much they have, have to pour into us. The coaches, they don't get enough credit for having to get guys from high school to get them up to speed in a few weeks to play some grown men to have children to feed. You don't see that. You see them getting beat a lot and having a horrible record. You don't see the things that they go through day to day to make us better. So, I mean... Like this team this year with G League and Knight, they went six and forty. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a bunch. You gotta think, bro. It's, it's a bunch of young kids. You know what I mean? Playing to try to get their game better. You know what I'm saying? And I think uh, one thing that Adam Silver has said, and we forget so much about this, when some of our young talent didn't want to go to college or wanted to start, you know, banking on and kind of kicking the door on making money, you know, the, the G League really offered them a spot to really develop. You know showcase them for a year but also put a million dollars worth of money in their pocket yeah for sure I mean, i think i mean adam spoke to it clearly when he said you know he's not sure of the future before he felt there was a hole in the marketplace they were trying to fill and that marketplace is essentially the nil now so there yeah. there's actually uh has been there's so many people trying to get into the marketplace um you know whether it's the g league or whether it's nil and yeah. overtime elite yeah. And, you know, not as much, but, you know, it was it was it was a place it was a place for Brandon Jennings was like the first of his kind to go overseas and play yeah. a year. And then we saw uh, LaMelo went and did it yeah. when they went and played overseas, yeah. uh, actually. And so there there wasn't a marketplace. And now there's just plenty of folks in the space trying to compete for market share. Yeah, but how does this affect? the farm system like moving forward like we spoke last week we were like there's a lot of talent back in the day where AAU was just for the best to work on their game yeah. now we're getting to the point if you're looking at kids trying to think about like business to say now like yo come into this farm system and say technically you're going to make it best 70k when they're like sitting and being like all right from 16 go do that as opposed to being like hey i can go to the ncaa and go talk to an nil group and I'll buy yeah. me for $2 million. I think one thing that's this is starting to draw in between is like when kids are sacrificing money for uh, the future development, it's like, what does that do for our game as Americans? And then what yeah. does that just do for the overall game of basketball? We're sitting there and it's just like, all right, the, the highest bidder buys me. And now does that mean like more future top picks are kind of falling to the ground? Or is it like the development is further going to get more and more like shakier? Well, those are the questions to ask. <laughs> And uh, it's interesting, you know, do we have the right people in place to answer those questions? You know, um, 
I'm not speaking to politics when I say this, but I did read something where it says once you pass the age of whether it's 65 or 70, yeah. your brain starts to digress. Like your brain degenerates. Yeah. Oh, you know, like you don't operate in the same capacity. And that's not just in their body, but it's in your mind as well. So like we have folks who are making like some of the most important decisions for our future who essentially are on the, the downside. Mm-hmm. So imagine, you know, you paying, you know, it's only one LeBron, you know, but Father Tom is always Father Tom is undefeated. Yeah. And that's whether you're on the court or off the court. And so I always think about who's making some of these decisions and are they are they putting our future um future's best interests keeping that in mind as they're making some of these decisions because some folks is like, hey, I only got we laugh about this. I only got a couple of years left. I'm gonna make this last. And so like most old folks decisions are based on I only got but so much time. So let me maximize it. Yeah. You know, you only got but got a few a few folks uh who, you know, historically have said, all right, I'm sacrificing myself for the better of the future. Like we it's only but so many of them and most of them aren't in politics in the first damn place. Yeah. So it's just interesting to see how uh this is all going to play out. But I mean, Adam said it in his quote in terms of like turning their focus to earlier development and and what we do with that and then how we properly develop our talent, like you said, because, you know, when we're getting they're getting to the league, you know, Adam said it was holes in the marketplace. When they get into the league, they got holes in their game. We trying to fix yeah, and holes in their development as well. I think one thing with the night was like the first couple of years, like even when you look they're Jalen Green was playing with Jared Jack. Yeah. Like, you understand what I'm saying? They're playing with, like, legit – they're being coached by former NBA guys. They're playing with former pros and vets that really play at a high level where it's like mm-hmm. – we just spoke to Jamal Crawford and talks about how we teach each other the game. We teach each other, and, and, and we, we speak so much on, like, leave the game better than when you found it. But also, too, you have a responsibility in order to the next generation to push that forward. And I think one thing that gets lost in the sauce – a lot of times when you go back to college and stuff, it's like, I'll meet a kid and it's like, no, listen to your coach and do everything you have to do. But when you look back on it, it's like, how would he know what it takes to get to the league? Or like, hey, man, like maybe they, they played you scary or like you just want to touch your foot in the league because somebody raised you to be the 15th man or with a, a two-way mindset, much more than like knowing what the real talent is. You know what I'm saying? Point forward. I remember growing up and uh, I remember like Slam Magazine was like super hot at the time. And, you know, whoever had that one Slam Magazine, like the first day it came out and it exchanged hands like by class. And so like dudes are skipping our class, like who got it? Sneak into somebody else's classroom to get it. Like who got it? Like that was like our world of basketball. Like high school rankings were really big back then. And I'll never forget, like we had this we were just talking about hoopers and like, this was my first introduction to this guy. It was like, yo, this is dude at Michigan who ain't playing right now. But like this dude got everything like, man, this dude cold. I I didn't know who they were talking about. And it was like, yo, this dude ain't going to be there for long, but he got it. And it was Jamal Crawford and Michigan. Most people don't know was my dream school growing up. Like wow. I, I was introduced to basketball by Michael Jordan and the Fab Five. So it was Michael Jordan, of course, was first, but then the Fab Five, I'm that was like 90, 91. So I'm like seven, eight years old. That was when I like fell in love with the game. So Michigan was where I wanted to go to school. So I always followed. And you were right after uh track the trailer. Um yeah. and Gerard then uh, Ward, Maceo Gerard Bastion. Ward, Maceo Bastion, yeah. and uh, who was the guard yeah. that his three point percentage was better than his two point field goal percentage? Lou Bullock, probably. Lou Bullock, crazy. He's my he's my host. I'm my yes visit. sir, yes sir. So yeah. I go way back, and so you know I was following wow. following the lineage the lineage of Michigan basketball, and like you were like I think you might have been the last one because then they didn't really recruit me, and then they had whatever their their, their version of NIL. It was just. You were light years ahead of that. And so we want to uh, touch on that. But welcome, you know, the great, uh, probably one of the best six men, if not the six best men, uh, six man in NBA history to get 19,000 plus points is an incredible feat. And to play 20 years um, to have the success you had 
you know, being 40 years old, scoring 40, 50 points, 40 point, 50 point, like just to be a, a, a savant of the game of basketball, his crossover league in Seattle, hailing from Seattle. Uh, for You rarely see NBA players traveling across the country in the summer just to pull up in certain spots and his spot being the go-to spot. Um, and, you know, kind of being the foundation right now for uh, Seattle Hoops, which has always been a hotbed for great NBA players. Uh, just want to welcome Jamal Crawford to the show. Man, first off, that was an introduction. I'm honored <laughs> to be on. I've been <laughs> that was an intro, bro. Like I've been I've been watching y'all stuff. Y'all do such a good job. Thank you. Um and you guys have done a good job and I'm I'm f- trying to find the right words because you guys are are big for the culture. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. there's hoop stuff, there's hot take stuff. You guys are just big for the culture, period. You guys always shoot it straight. You always are teaching because there's a young generation out there right now that needs to learn. And you know, we needed it. And we have to, we have the voice and the platform to do that. So I appreciate y'all. It's crazy. I never knew you wanted to go to Michigan. Like I saw the Fab Five, and they they had me from the the from the baggy shorts to the ball heads, the swag, a little bit before my time was running Rebels. So everybody wanted to go to UNLV. You know what I mean? Like ninety one mm-hmm. around that time. But when I saw the Fab, bro, when I saw the swagger, I was like. I'm going to Michigan. I didn't have grades. I wouldn't be eligible at the time. I'm like, <laughs> if I make this shot in the backyard, I'm going to Michigan. And ET for you, bro, just like I, Isaiah always talks so highly of you and how you guys were in Boston and all the game you got. He's like, man, Mar, he got so much game, but, we, you know, he's in a row, obviously, but he could do so much. He's cold. So for y'all two savants to get together, I think it need, it's needed. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so needed right now. But, nah, bro, going back to Michigan, I never knew you wanted to go there. I should have. I should have told him something, man. Iggy wanted to come to Michigan? Come on, y'all. We got we can't drop the ball on that, bro. Like, that would have been crazy. Crazy. You went to Arizona with Gil and all those guys, but that would have been crazy if you would have came out that way, too. Yeah, I think it was – they might have been – well, I was a late bloomer, first and foremost. And so I didn't get recruited till July, the July before my senior year. Before that, okay. I was only getting – there was two schools looking at me, Bradley and Illinois State. But wow. outside of that, no one was talking. To, nobody heard of me. So Nike camp was like July fifth or whatever, right after, uh, yeah. right after Independence Day, uh, whatever that means. No, that's when I first started getting recruited. Was like I was much later than most folks. And ET is similar. And so um, Michigan, um, they had a kid from the fa- the family who was left handed, and like they recruited my position already. Like a bunch of guys are already committed. And uh, I forgot his name, left-handed cat. He could hoop, though, play for the family. We had some good battles. Um, and I was a late bloomer, so I didn't really talk. I forgot his name. I didn't really catch him until, Crawford. like. Nah, nah, nah. I, I, I know his name, too, if I heard it. But he was lefty, wing. He could shoot a little bit, play for the Robert family. Is. He was he was in my class. So you probably don't remember him either, ET. But, and they were kind of going through that transition, you know, uh, switching coaches yeah. and all those things. But, um. Taking us back, you know, most folks know about, you know, like you from Seattle and where you're from. Uh, and even most, a lot of people just know about Seattle as a basketball culture. And then me going to Arizona, I knew a lot about the, the uh, Northwest. The Doug Renz and guys like that. The yeah. B-Roys, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and even uh, Marvin Williams, I was his wow. host. I was his yep. host at Arizona. So uh, it was the Portland guys and it was the Seattle guys. And like those were the hotbeds in the Northwest. So Arizona was always making a run up there. But there was also there was also this thing where most guys from the Northwest were weird because of the rain. <laughs> Have you have you ever thought have you ever heard that and I've heard I've heard that before, bro. <laughs> I've heard you, I can't deny it. Because <laughs> it rains so much. So, you know, we're always inside. We always like, man, they look at them a little weird. Like, hold up. They they don't even get the proper sun. They gotta be a little weird. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I definitely heard that. It's 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 crazy you say that and hearing your guys' story. So I was in Seattle, I went to LA and I came back to Seattle. And when I came back at 16, nobody knew who I was besides the people that see me leave. Uh-huh. Like, I, I didn't, like, I played AU two years of my life. I played AU in my fifth grade year, and I was Rotary. Uh, I, I coach Rotary right now, but they were CAY then. I played for CAY. And so they, they've always kept 10 traditionally. I was the 10th guy on the team. And my mom was like, go get better. And I'm like, you're right. I got to go get better. And my skill was there, but the intensity of AU and travel, I wasn't there yet. Yeah. I've always been a thin dude, so I'm like, I'm just going to get better, go get better. 
And then my last year, I'm the best player in the state. Everybody kind of knows it. And this was this story is gonna mess you up. And I'm gonna send you guys some footage to, to match this. But I, I make the A team, quote unquote, right? We always kept two teams. I had guys on the team that thought they could do what I do. I'm like, cool, I'm gonna go to the B team. So I went for the best player in the state, went playing the back gyms in Vegas and California as the pump classic and big time at the time. Uh, those two tournaments, I made all American from the B team. And that's when Michigan came. That's when like I became a national like thing. And Coach Carl, he was it was Rotary and Friends of Hoop. So he started Friends of Hoop in Seattle. Mm-hmm. So I was one of his first teams. And so he used to come to all the games and everything. In the back gym, I had every college coach in the country there after I blew up in that time period. In two weeks, bro, I went from just a local guy to a national, nationally known, I guess. That's crazy, and that's how it went down. No, that's absolutely crazy, and obviously it's because of your unique talent. But where did that come from? Because this is Point Forward Podcast. You grew up, yeah. you know, relatively tall, six six, six seven. So back in the day, that would be a forward position, but you always had the, the gift and blessings of a point guard. So how are you able to continue to develop that skill, but most importantly, not get transformed into a big man or, you know, not get, you know, overshadowed for the things you couldn't do or like the lack of physicality. How are you able to stay true to yourself and get somebody to really, you, you've been playing your whole way, your whole life. And like you said yeah. earlier, Isaiah was like, yo, I'm good, but I play a role, but it's a special gift to be able to go all around the world and be able to implement who you are. It's crazy. That's a great question because my, my first coach, coach Bugs, we call him Bugs, but it's coach Love. He had me play center because I was one of the taller guys. So I played center on defense, but I played point guard on offense. And he always had the ball in my hands. Yeah. And this is a crazy thing. And IT will tell you, and I don't know if Channing's going to tell you, Iggy, but IT will tell you, in Seattle in the summer, like, I'm really a point guard. Like, I can pass, but I'm not going to score. Yeah, and it's, it's crazy because people don't know me for that. Oh, he's a buck. He's, that's true, but I can actually like passing more. And so, you know what it is. When you get in the NBA, you put you in a row and all that, and you, you try to be the best at it. But – I always played point guard, and my dad played at the University of Oregon. So he played with Kevin Love's dad, actually, at the University of Oregon. Oh, yeah. So I've always been around the game. Yeah, I've always been around the game, and I've always studied the game. I used to collect cards. I used to watch everybody. Um, funny story about that. I'll fast forward just a minute. Jerry Krause, when I went to work out for the Bulls, who you know, you guys know well, mm-hmm. he drafted me based on – there was a team that wanted to hire me a couple years ago, and they said – Jerry Krause said – uh, you were the only guy he's ever had come in his, in his office and could identify two players that are on the wall. It was a picture from like 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I, he didn't ever tell me that, but he told this team that the team was going to hire me based off of that. So going back now, I've always been a student. I've always studied the game. And I, the way I played, it was just natural to me. My first layup ever, it was I was eight years old. I was on my first team. And, you know, coach, two-line layups. Everybody's doing two-line layups. Yeah, yeah. The first layup I ever did, I went behind my back and I did a jelly. As we know, a jelly now. I did a jelly. And I wasn't trying to be fancy. That's just how I played. And my dad was like, all right, because he knew about the game. He's like, if you're going to play like this, you got to own it. Like, you can't, you know, it can't be a hot dog thing. You got to, like, be the best at it. And so, for me, that was just my flow. And I remember as a kid, I used to always ask people, because I studied the NBA, who I play like, man? They'd be like, man, you got a little bit of this dude, a little bit of that, but you don't really play like nobody. As a kid, that killed me. That crushed me. I'm like, how am I going to make it to the NBA if I don't play like nobody there? Yeah. yeah. Fast forward, um, I just always kept my flow and my, like, my bop and everything. And I studied so many different people from Nick Van Axel to Steve Francis to Isaiah to, to Tim Hardaway to Iverson to, like, so many different people. And I was stealing. I literally stole from everybody. I stole from y'all. Y'all don't even know it. I've never even told y'all. I stole from y'all. And I, Iggy, I just watched today when you crossed over dude and point out, and that was crazy, by the way. But um, when you see Miller. I stole from everybody, bro. And so for me, I just try to put it together and make my own game, but I want to make my game work. Like, I came up through an era where it was like, man, that M1 stuff ain't going to work. That ain't gonna, How's that going to work in the – forget the pros. How's that going to work in the Big Ten? You're going to Michigan, bro. How's that going to work? Mm-hmm. I'm like, bro, I'm not trying to be fancy. I'm just playing. And so I just try to own it, own it, and – that's the thing I think I'm most proud of my whole career, 20 years, 20 different coaches. And you guys know they put you in a different box, in a different role. I never lost myself. I adjusted. I went to the bench. I did all that, but I never lost how I played. And I thought that's what I'm most proud about. Sorry, that was so long-winded, but I just nah. had to kind of touch everything. Sorry about that. So do you think some of your early trials and tribulations is what got you, you know, right in that situation because you left 
we left Seattle, went to Michigan, and, you know, obviously mm-hmm. got in a little bit of trouble to the point where you weren't able to play. So what's the whole thing during that time? Like, yo, just keep having fun, keep staying focused on the bigger goal. Because back in the day, we in that type of trouble, what you do off the court or even like academically affects what you do, you know, moving forward because you had to have like a squeaky clean image, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's crazy because I didn't, the, the rule amateurism kind of started with me because I didn't get the gifts they said I got from like an alumni or a booster or AAU coach or none of that. Yes. So there wasn't really a, a rule for it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So yeah. when it happened and I got in trouble, they first they banned me from college basketball. I was banned. I didn't even, the school didn't even want to tell me I was banned because they were already fighting it and they fought it and we won. And they're like, okay, you got to miss, I think it was seven or eight games. We only have five left. So if I came back my sophomore year, I was about to miss the first three. I didn't even plan on leaving my sophomore year, bro. I just didn't want to go to summer school. And I just left to go to Seattle. I'm getting homesick. I'm in Michigan. Yeah. I go home for the summer. Like, all right, you're there three weeks. Time to go to summer school. I'm like, no, nah, I'm, I just got here. I'm like, I'm going to put my name in the draft. If I do that, they can't tell me to come back. So I'm trying to outsmart how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I put my name in the draft. And at that time, there's mock drafts. You're going second round. You're not going to be heard of. All that. And then I just use it as fuel. I never got down because – somebody says something bad about me. And I never was too high because somebody said something good. Like half the people going to say, you're not going to do it. Other half going to say, you are going to do it. I didn't like hold harbor any feelings. My thing was like, I'm just going to prove the ones that believe me, they're right. And so for me, I just kept that attitude, kept that mindset. I put my name in the draft. I go to Chicago camp and play two days. I showed up late, played two days, turn it out. And they're like, oh, you ain't got to, you're good. You ain't got to do nothing else. And I go lottery. So I wasn't even leaving Michigan. That wasn't the plan. I put my name in it. It worked like magic. And ET, this is this is the <laughs> one exception. You know, there's an exception to every rule. So ET has this thing called a finesse fest, and the finesse worked this time. <laughs> ET, <laughs> hey, <laughs> the finesse. Hey, bro, I'm a, I'm gonna tell you how really this finesse. I've never told this. This is breaking right here. I came up. I was sore because we was playing so hard. Pause. No diddy. I was sore, <laughs> and 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 they was like. And the guy who was running, his name is Dwight. He used to work for OKC. He was, used to work for the Sonics as well. I used to always go play with the Sonics. So we're going through the testing of the combine. And I was like, man, I'm like my, my uh, groin is sore, you know, in my back or something. I forgot what it was. And he's like, oh, Crawford's sore. shut down. And from that point on, teams were like, yo, just come, come speak with us. Just come. I went to Dallas to meet with Mark Cuban. I met with Joe Dumars in Detroit. Bro, not the Bulls. I didn't work out for anybody. I went to Milwaukee with George Carr. I just talked to him. Just kind of interview with him. And that was the finesse. You're absolutely right. You're right, E.T. That was my one time. <laughs> <laughs> so so when you came into the league, I remember being a kid and I was, you know, in love with your lefty hezzy pull up. You know what I mean? Appreciate it. And yeah. uh, I remember, uh, you know, I, I used to be a kid trying to practice on that. And then, you know, you got drafted in a lottery and shortly after they drafted Jay Williams out of Duke. Yeah. And when that comes down, but I always talk about the mindset of, uh, you know, you even look at Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown when they were drafted back to back so hot. What do you think in that moment when, you know, you're still trying to get your game going, you still hadn't really played much basketball in that sense since high school. And then, uh, you know, they draft another guy to apparently be the future point guard. And what do you remember from the time of, uh, that injury, that gruesome motorcycle injury? Bro, it was so crazy because, so remember I said I blew up the last year. There was an EA Sports game in the Bay. It was the first one. And everybody that pretty much played McDonald's played in that game. Uh, Mm. Jay Will, DeMar Johnson, Mike Dunleavy, Boozer, like Kenny Satterfield. Everybody was in that game playing McDonald's. So it was almost like, it was like a McDonald's 2.0. And that was my first time seeing Jay Will, right? I I heard about him. That was my first time seeing him. So we played against each other, had a couple moments. Obviously, you know, I know who he is now. I play against him again at Duke, uh, at Michigan, Michigan Duke. Yeah. I go crazy. They won the game. He took over late. So he had some history. Now I get drafted to the Bulls. I got drafted off potential. Like you said, I played two years of high school, a half a year of college. I don't, I don't know what I don't know. I just know I'm a talent, right? So I don't really understand how that works. Um, so first year I, I played terrible. My rookie year was awful. The next going into it, I started working out with Jordan and I started working out at hoops and oh, that was life changing. But I started working out with him 
and I could feel my – it was so weird, bro, and I know you guys have been through it at different points. I felt my game go to a whole different level that summer. He's coming to me for game winners. This ain't just an all-star, this is the GOAT. Like, he's saying yeah. you got game. You know what I mean? So it's a totally different feeling. So I'm working out with him. Whole summer goes. We don't lose a game the whole summer. I tear my ACL. So now I'm primed for this big second year. I tear my ACL. He was unbelievable, by the way. He led me to the doctor I went to, Dr. Andrews in, in Birmingham, because yeah. he was in Alabama through baseball. He uh-huh. led me to him. Uh, he took care of me. No, I didn't lose a car with MJ. That's a whole nother story. We'll get into that later if we want. But <laughs> no, nah, but um, so he took care of me. Uh, and then uh, now I, I have to miss the, the first part of the third year. But I come back. I have my highest shooting thing. I finally pr- perfect my jumper. I'm working on that the whole time. And so I'm like, okay, like I'm starting to, they're starting to see like I can play. I was a lottery pick. I, can, I got some game. I'm in the draft room that night. And they draft Jay Williams. And me, Eddie Curry was here. And you can ask, you see this. I looked at him. He looked at me like, oh, man. And I left. Because, fellas, this at a time, this isn't positionless basketball. Like, yeah. if you're a point, you're a point. If you're a two, yeah. you're a two. This is it. There's yeah. no positionless basketball. They bring Jay Will on his on his draft uh, his draft workout. I shouldn't even say it. I've never said this either. We actually played against each other during the draft workout. That's not even legal, I don't think. But we're going at each other. And so his team won the majority of the games, but I got the best of them. And everybody's like, ooh, this is going to be interesting. They still draft him. And you can go back and look it up. Bill Carr writes the coach, and he's like, no, either one's going to play or one's going to play. It's not going to be them playing together, not one second. So if there's 48 minutes and he's playing 32, I'm playing 16. That's just what it is. So that every practice was hell because we're competing for minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like we're really going at it every single day until the second half of the year. They put us together. He's like, you guys ain't going to win. Let's, and I think I averaged 19 and 7. He averaged 18 and 6. And we're rolling, playing together, playing pick and roll. Remember, we was playing triangle coming in. Yep. We had that old school approach. We're playing pick and roll. We're getting to it. We're finally, our friendship has grown because now we're not competing. We're like really rooting for each other. And I remember that day so vividly, bro. It's myself, him, and Jalen Rose. We're in the facility. And Jalen Rose saw him on the bike. He's like, yo, be careful on that bike. And Jay's like, nah, you know, you know, I'm good. I'm good. It's in the summer. And we heard about there's no, there's no social media. Back then, if something happened, it came out the next day in the paper. You had to really yeah. wait. You know what I'm saying? It's like a delay. And so we heard about the next day. And we we're like, is it true? Is it true? And then we talked to the Bulls. It was true. And they were talking about amputating his leg and just like, it was crazy because we could have been so great. To, not good. We could have been so great together because yeah. we had a mutual respect. We both could score. People forget Jay Will was like how Reggie Bush was looked at coming out of high, out of college in football. He was the exact yeah. same way. Like he was putting yeah. on shows, him and Duan, those guys down there. We would have been crazy together. Yeah. Now, so you, you, you speak, you know, you spoke earlier before, or I read earlier before how your sisters thought you were yeah. a mute growing up. Like you didn't yeah, speak, yeah, didn't you talk. didn't speak much, right? I didn't and speak. so now you speak so well about the game, you know, and it made me think about it, it when you were just giving that story. Like you know, you're so in depth. Like you remember vividly, like certain moments. We all do as hoopers, like you know that special, you know, EA Classics game, or you know the day that the the, the wreck happened with Jay Will. When did that like transition happen for you, where you were just coming into your own and you were just like comfortable, like? I speak a lot. Like when did when did that change happen for you? That's was it basketball? Question. You know, you know what I mean? No, nah, that's a great question because they really thought I was mute. I didn't speak to anybody, but I always observed. Like I've always observed everything. I've always been very aware. I've always watched everything going on. But like I think I was always like that. With my friends, like if I was comfortable with you, I always spoke. But I just didn't speak out loud a lot. I think towards the end of high school when I started getting interviewed more. Remember, I was you were you said you were a late bloomer, but I didn't even come on the scene until 16, 17. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. now that's an eternity. Like yeah. my son's known now at 12. Like it's crazy. You know what I mean? So to see how things have changed, but for me, when I started doing more interviews and then people were like, Oh, you speak, you speak well. I'm like, thank you. This is, you know, kind of how I speak, but I just didn't speak often. Hmm. I've always taught you have two ears and one mouth, so you could you can listen twice as much as you speak. So I always try to what I learned about myself is I love to go to barbershops. I love to be around older dudes and just get game and wisdom. And I say a word, just kind of watch and listen and learn. And so for me, I just took all that. And it's crazy now that this is my job. Like I speak all the time now, but 
yeah, I didn't I didn't speak a lot then, but at 16, 17, things kind of changed for me. And you talk about, uh, you know, also as well, you did so much uh, throughout your career. What were some of your most favorite memories and some of your most favorite teams you played for? Because you played for how, how many teams was it? 15, 20 plus? Nine. I guess we don't count that that Brooklyn Nets game as, as, as a whole team, but we, I played for nine teams. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there was nothing like, I have different moments, right? Like I'll, I'll see old clips of myself now, social media, everything lives on. But I saw a clip when I threw it off the backboard when I was with the Bulls and we were playing the Sonics. Mm-hmm. And I remember at that time period, the battle I was going through just to sh- show you belonged in the league, getting that NBA confidence. You know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, you nice. Uh, when you get that NBA confidence, the game slows down. And that was the first moment like, ooh, okay. When that worked, I ran back like I was supposed to do. I'm like, damn, that's my NBA confidence. I'm here now. When I did the, the double behind back on Aaron McKee in Philly, that was the first time I brought it out with the Bulls. Like, moments like that. But then, like, going to the Garden, and, and Heath Ledger is a fan. He becomes a fan after watching you in the garden. Or Jay Z's there every game. Or like that's when I was like, dang! Like now I'm, I'm I feel like I'm on stage performing. I'm established, but now I'm on stage performing. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a different feel. And then the Lakers, I felt. I mean the Lakers, the Clippers. I felt like was like the best team. People forget we were the last team to put out. Iggy's Warriors before they won that run. Like we were one of the last teams to actually do well. I, all, I always say y'all y'all should at least won one chip. Just one, bro. Just one, right? At we least. could have got one chip. Shit. Bro, if you look back, we had every single piece you needed at different points. But Shit. we weren't mentally tough. And that's where you guys had the advantage and you guys were more together. And I think you saw we weren't together at times when adversity hit. Mm-hmm. always feel like adversity doesn't just build character, reveals it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're going to learn a lot about your teammate. You're going to learn how he really feel. And then on the flip side of that, like you just saw, I saw you, Iggy, you, you called Wiggs. Like, he yelled at him, you got on him, but he knew it was coming from a good place. Right. And I think you guys, like, took advantage of the moment, and we always thought we had time on our hands. Like, mm-hmm. even after that, we played the Spurs after they won the finals, and we put them out in the first round. Boom. Then we go up 3-1 three, three, on Houston. We're like, oh, it's the year. And we're gonna play the Warriors team that Steph is hurt now. His ankles hurt. I'm like, oh, this is it. We thought we was gonna see y'all. Year. Yeah. And we thought we was gonna see y'all. And so you just don't get the moments back. And if you look back now, myself, JJ, Paul Pierce, uh, Doc before he went back to coaching, um, Matt Barnes, everybody's on TV, everybody's doing mm-hmm. something. So it shows the IQ and stuff was there, right? Yeah. But the mental toughness to like really push through and like fellas you guys don't get this moment again take advantage now we didn't really like own that part yeah that that, that was that was an incredible team i thought y'all at least would get one even the year y'all lost to okc i think yeah that was another it, time it, Those that was times. another time yeah the okc year the okc year but um i remember the s dot carter collection and <laughs> you know you were with the knicks and you know it feels like, you know, throughout now, it's like guys have found a lane for themselves with for fashion sure. and with shoes. Sure. You know, like people forget, like Wilson Chandler used to wear, you know, retros when he played. Yeah, or even yeah. even Kawhi Leonard used to wear crazy yeah. retros. Yeah. Uh, he used to wear Nike Air Maxes, the Fab Five hat. And like it wasn't as much of a thing back then, but I felt like you were at the forefront of that where it wasn't like your own signature shoe or per se, or it wasn't like it had to be a Nike that always stood out. But for you to take, you know, a, a casual Gucci printed classic, that's a high top yeah. and go out there and perform the way you did. Um, how was that moment for you? And then I got a follow up to that. What's crazy about that is at the time, Jalen Rose and myself were both for Reebok and our lockers are right by each other. So, you know, you get a little box, he get a box. You know, he get a box of sweats or whatever. I get a box of sweats or shoes, like the classic kind of stuff. And one day I looked over at my at my locker and I saw him. I looked over at his. I didn't see him. I'm like, let me tuck these away. What are these? So then I see it's the S. Dot Carter. And Steve Stout hit me. And Brian Lee from Reebok was like, yep. yo, if you can wear these, Jay's going to come out with a high top for a basketball shoe. He's already doing the low top. That's his thing. And you were going to be the first athlete to wear them. I'm like, what? I'm like, oh, I'm wearing it. It's like, no, no, you got to wear it for a couple of days to see if you actually like them. Our first game, my first game wearing was against Philly. And I remember, hey, I was like, you can wear those, you can hoop and hoop. And I think I played well, but they weren't the safest shoe looking back. But I just absolutely loved, like, culture. I've always loved music. I've always loved who, you know, those, those worlds collide. So for me, I've always thought, you know, 
when I was on the block in the hood, I always felt like I was representing them when I went to the court. Bro, there was times when I played for the Knicks. If we played a matinee game at like 12, at 4 o'clock, I go to the park and ask them what moves they want me to do. Like, I was always tapping <laughs> in with the coach. You know what I'm right. saying? And I go right. play and hoop. Right. And so for me, I just always felt like those two worlds always collided. So to look back now, I know that I was kind of, you know, towards the forefront of that with such an iconic person and Jay, a one-on-one person for him to... And we even had a commercial for him, too. I don't know yep. if you saw the commercial. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, for sure. I, saw, I remember seeing that in real time. And my follow to that is, you know, you we were just speaking about your game and how you had to fit that style. Like, you had to fit who you naturally were into a half-court style of basketball, yeah. the triangle. You know, you play, you said 20 different cultures, coaches, and so you had to stick yeah. to who you were. And then now we're in an era of basketball where you get a lot of old folks who make gripe or we have issues with the all-star game or, you know, there's a high usage for one or two guys per team. And, you know, you don't see – certain types of gamesmanship or high IQ things from everyone on the floor. You know, everyone's their gripes about the game today. But for you having success in the way you played back then, you know, what do you think of the game now? And how can we make sure, like, the the main goal every each and every night is, like, top-tier competitive edge? You know, because even though you, we were friends with players back in our day, but when we stepped on the court, we competed well, we at a competed. super high level. And so – you know, give me your acceptance of the game today, you as a TNT analyst and, you know, where you would like to see the game go. I think the game is, if we just went one through 12, I think guys are more skilled, right? I think top to bottom guys are more skilled. Guys are having more trainers. Guys are, you know, investing in their bodies. They're doing a lot of different things. I give them that. But the competitive fabric is missing. And that's why somebody like Ant Edwards or Jason Tatum stand out to us so much because they're so they're such dogs. Mm-hmm. They are dogs, but they're kind of from our era. That's how a lot of guys were in our era as far as not talent wise, but mentality wise. Right. And and that's the difference. You know, Iggy, from going, you gotta guard Kobe tonight. You know what he's on. ET, you know, now you gotta guard, you know, Lou Will or you gotta guard uh Isaiah, if you're on a different team, like you know what they're about and what they're on. And so for me, especially now coach on the grassroots level as well. I'm kind of connected to both generations and future generations. Mm -hmm. I think if we're just talking NBA, I think it has to be a mandatory. If if I was commissioned for a day, I'd make it a mandatory that three spots are available guys 10 years and above. Because I feel like they can kind of help set the tone. I didn't learn how to be a pro until I had Charles Oakley and Rick Brunson and Scottie Pippen. And like, no, being on time is being early. You can't eat McDonald's no more, bro. You can't do that no more. Even wearing two pairs of socks in training camp, like little things you don't know that can protect your feet, like those little jewels. It should be a mandatory that there's three guys that are really good vets, not just any three guys, but really good vets, three guys, 10 years and above that don't take a roster spot. So you still have your 15, but you have three guys allotted. I think even the situation that happened in Memphis with Ja, I'm not saying a person could, could have stopped that, but they may have slowed it down if they saw stuff. You know what I mean? We all have had that. And I think that helped change the course of our career. Like having those vets, I think is is a mandatory and the competitive edge of, you know, like nah, that's that's your boy, but y'all got to go at it. Like this is because you know what? There's a whole nother generation they're not thinking about. Like these kids are looking at. Like I took my son to the All Star game. How can I tell him that? Like you got to compete every possession. You got when the best of the best are kind of just chilling. He's mm-hmm. like, Dad, but look, look at this person or this. You know what yeah. I mean? So that part of it, I think having those vets having guys who love the game purely and then, you know, everything that comes with it comes with it. But let's love the game purely and grow from there. Well, you speak about, uh, you know, having a connection, loving the culture and loving the game purely, but also being a trendsetter. And one thing that, uh, you know, the, the Honorable Spencer Hall has always talks about is uh, <laughs> all and, uh, you know, how he's always looked out for the younger hoop crowd, hoop session, almost to the point where, uh, you know, Jay Crossover is synonymous with summer basketball, you know, right. uh, the crossover league. And when it comes down to it, wh- where did you feel like uh, you had that responsibility really put on? Because every person from Seattle literally always says, Uncle Jamal, Uncle Jamal, Uncle Jamal. Even when you come back and, you know, when I stopped and visited Spencer, I just stopped by the league because I'm like, man, I just want to see a game. You just want to see like, it, yeah. And that's all I want to hear about. And from there, you look at guys, even when I talked to Isaiah, he always gave you hella credit for, you know, the path that he was on along with Spencer and a lot of other hoopers. So I, how do you feel, you know, did you see that starting out when you first, you know, came onto the scene and you were number one player in the state? Did you leave Seattle and say, yo, I need to really put on for 
the city or was it something that just really popped back up and, you know, it, it was a, a thirst for it when you just kept doing philanthropic work? So that's a great question. I think for me personally, because remember I said I was in L.A. And when I came back to Seattle, my name like grew in the city. Right. And so now I'm going from just hooping. And, where's the best runs at the Y to now the Sonics have me working on their facility. I'm working yeah. out with Doug Christie. And when I was with Gary Payton and Doug Christie, that's what changed my life. So Doug, he went to the same high school. But I didn't have his phone number. And he, he was a gym. It's probably like 45 minutes away. I drive a car with no license plates, catch a bus, whatever it was to get that knowledge. I didn't want his phone number. I'm like, just show me how to be a pro. And so if the gym, if he's like, all right, with me at the gym at 7, I'll be out there at 630 waiting on him. So he was like, man, this kid's different. He's not asking me for a few dollars. He's not asking me for nothing. He, he was the first person I saw have a foam roll. And he's the first person I saw work out with like ankle weights. You know what I'm saying? Like, wait, man, this is 97, bro. And so when a pro took interest in me and says, you can do it if you do this, this, and that, you got to be in the best shape. You got, I'm like, okay. So I'm just watching them, studying them. And then for me, it changed my life. And I played in his league. It was Doug Christie's league before it was mine when he passed it to me. And I know what it did for me. And when I went to the Bulls, I saw Tim Hardaway over here, you know, working out. I saw uh, Antoine Walker over here. They would hoop together. But I didn't really see them, no disrespect, I didn't see them together, like, off the court doing much. So I said, you know what? When I go home, I want to make sure everybody's tight, everybody's together. And I'm still here. I'm here all summer. I didn't take vacations, none of that. So they saw me in the same YMCA's, the same playgrounds, and they could touch me. So it was like, if he's saying I can make it, that's what it was. So then it's, okay, here comes B-Roy, here comes Nate, here comes Isaiah, here comes... T. Will, here comes Spencer. Here comes I took Spencer to record, bro. Like here comes yeah, you know what I'm about Dipset. Yeah. Yeah. He got there wearing all red with Dipset. I'm like, come on, Spencer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like, whoa. So <laughs> literally every single player, Martell, like every single one, I just try to give to them purely. Like I didn't want nothing from them but to give them the best resources, the best knowledge to like we can do this. And I think that's the thing that that is kind of underrated. The Sonics left in 2008. Like in Chicago, they got the Bulls. In the Laker, in LA, they got the Lakers and Clippers. So these yeah. kids in the generation can actually look and see a LeBron playing or, you know, D Lo or whoever it is. We haven't had that since 2008. But if you look, we probably had 25 pros since 2008. And to me, that says the effect we've had on the city as far yeah. as being reachable. There's an eighth grader right now that can text Zach Levine, hey, can you watch this tape with me? Or text DeJounte Murray or text Paulo. I have, bro, I have Paulo. So Kyrie hit me, right? He texts me. This is last year in Boston. He's going to it last year. He's like, Ma, I'm going to be up in Washington. I need to chill for him up. I need you to set up. I set up private runs for him all over the city. Zach Levine's in the pros at the time. DeJounte's in the pros at the time. I have Paolo as a 15-year-old kid in these runs. After the runs are over, for a month, after the runs are over, Kyrie's like, yo, what college is he at? I'm like, no, he's in high school. <laughs> Paolo's at Duke now. You see what I'm saying? So, like, everything... I had the great late the late great Mr. Bill Russell coming to watch the runs. All tucked away. I find out what kind of smoothie Kai, Kai likes. So I have it all set up. Everything's dialed in. I have refs. I have all this stuff dialed in. And I was trying, he wanted to get the rust off. He hadn't played in the season. So I was trying to simulate game formats for him. I never told the story. He told it. So now we can talk about it. But like for me, like seeing Paolo as a 15-year-old kid and working out with him every single day, and same as DeJounte. I've known him since he was in sixth grade. And for them to say, man, that moment changed my life. That And they do it to the next generation. They they help them. And to me, it's not the crabs in the bucket mentality. And that's what makes Seattle basketball special. Now, that's, a, that's amazing because uh, even when you talk about it as well, you, you continue to uh, coach for your son's team. Mm-hmm. I think one thing that occurs is a lot of parents are trying to figure out, especially former athletes, are like, how much should I be involved? I don't want to ruin the game for them. Is this tough? Is that tough? It's like, how do you go about that? Because you're you're building killers. Isaiah has a killer. Will Conroy has a killer. There's a Mm -hmm. bunch of killers. Is there any advice you can give to parents, especially Lil Dre? It's now four star four star prospect. Really really put it (laughs) on. And what's crazy about that is we watched Dre play. (laughs) Yeah, we literally watched him play. In where we L A. L A. Yeah, yeah. We're L A. And you could see like it's it's amazing, right? So sometimes you see. I'm on the circuit. You see kids yeah. who, they're good now, right? You can see it now. Like, oh, they're more developed. They're aggressive. They've been the guy. Then you can look at somebody like Dre. And you're like, oh, he's going to be a pro. You can just see it. 
You yeah. can see everything about him. His makeup, his IQ more so. His IQ alone is going to separate him. Like the way he plays the game. And for me, to answer your question, like, yeah, you have those killers. But to me, what's in your bag? What's in your bag isn't how many moves you can do. And that's crazy coming from me, right? Because I, I had him. <laughs> but what's in your bag is, no, this is a catch and shoot day. No, this is a get downhill and drive and kick day. And that's what we're teaching our kids the importance. Because if you know how to play, you'll play longer. You'll play at a higher level. You can play with more people. Look at y'all. Like, look at all of us, the way we could adjust. We were all stars once upon a time at some point. But we could adjust and play with other people. But you can only do that if you know how to play the game. And that's what we're teaching. Like, yeah, you can get buckets. But can you – I, I talked to Draymond. I was on his pod. And we talked about Luca, And I told my, me and my son had the conversation. I'm like, how many points does Luca score? He said 73. How many assists? Um, he had a lot. I don't remember. I said he had 14. But the difference is if he had 50 points and was shooting every time, he wouldn't have got to 73 because they would have been like, oh, let's double team now. It's easy. But the mm-hmm. trick with Luca is he puts you in a bag because he puts you in his own bag because when he's scoring, he's assisting as well. How do you guard that? Yeah. You don't know how to guard because he's doing both. And now you don't know what to do. And now he's in control of every single thing. So, I, yeah, we're raising killers, but we're raising them how to do it the right way as well. Keep your confidence. And I was hard on my son the first year. Like, I, I, I wasn't coaching him. I was like dab all him in the wrong way. Like, no, I'm going to – everything I feel about these kids, I'm going to say to you because you're my son. You should know better. <laughs> and I had to grow and evolve. I'm like, no, I got to treat you like everybody else and teach you like I would anybody else. And so that part was hard for me, but I've gotten a lot better at just coaching them versus yelling and doing the dad thing. And that's what I'm most afraid of because I've yet to coach him. And mm. I think going into the senior year, I might be a little bit more involved. And every scenario I play in my head, I play the scenario of – I'm only yelling at him and then I have to pull myself. So I'm like trying to prepare for it in terms of like, I don't want to curse out nobody else kid, not curse out mine. Or, right, right, right. But you know, Dre, it's just, that's that balance. Like you say, the best advice I could give you this, is my third year now is just coaching, just mm-hmm. coaching. Even if you have a message, you ain't, you don't have to yell. Uh, man, I saw Mike Moon post this a while ago. He said, if you want something to like, if you want grass to grow, it doesn't grow with thunder. It grows with rain. Like you have to, you know what I mean? Like you have yeah. to absolutely like just nurture him and coach him like you would if his last name was Jones or whatever. Yeah. You'll it'll be better for him. It'll be better for you. It's funny because ET, you're coaching him with Celtics right now. No, I, re- I, re- I, re- I stopped after 2021. I can't okay. do that. I can't do that. 15. It's hours. tough. Yeah, I, it's tough. It's a lot. But I was, I was talking thing. to JT about that about his dad. <laughs> his dad coached him. He's really really hard on him. Yeah, and so like. That that kind of helped change me in a way, like, you know what, just coach him. Just coach him. I think it'll be better for both of you guys' relationship. I got a quick if question. You get into it. There was a kid, my <clears throat> son played Seattle Rotary in Portland. ET is when I stayed at your place for my son's tournament. And there was a kid for Seattle Rotary. His dad was a coach. He was like 10 at the time, same age as my son. So he's, <laughs> six, he's 16 right now. Who Legend was Legend Smiley? Oh my God. Legend Smiley. He's still here. Shout him? out to Ledge. You know what's crazy? B. Roy coaches him right now. Oh, Legis- okay. Et he got it. He when he was ten, yeah. I'm like he got it. I was like, yo, how tall it, is he? Iggy I, now he's like six five, six six. Can yep. go. Yeah, I, I just it. told Damon Stoudemire, you got to go after him. Like he's serious. I, I great knew it. kid too. Unbelievable kid. Great kid. I knew it. Watching him play at Black ten, Smiley. I'm like, yep. Shout out to my I guy said, Black. if he grows, he's going like he going a lot of places. Et I saw yeah. when he's ten years old. I saw. He's I was like, five right now. Yeah, I, 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 I never forget that kid. And yeah. got a cannon, does not yeah. miss. Yeah. Yes. I saw it when he was 10. I haven't seen him since, E.T. Like, I, I'll oh, never forget cold. that. <laughs> really? One of the best yeah. players on the West Coast, easy. Yeah. He's cold. Yeah. So, Great so Jim, give us, a, if you could, because there's so many Hoopers and scorers, give us your top five out of Seattle, if you could. Oh. Like, and, and, and you get to add one extra. Pause. All right, so are we saying, like, best players or best scores? Best let, give us two different lists. Best right. player, the best scores that matters. I'm, I'm not putting myself on either one, but best player in the Seattle Tacoma area, I'm gonna have to go with Doug Christie's Myology. So I'm always putting him there. Mm-hmm. Jason Terry, it mm-hmm. yeah. Nate Robinson. I just got affinity for Nate because Nate is Nate was something else, and then. I feel like I'm missing Zach Levine. Let's say I'm just going to do him because he's the older of the new generation. So I'm going to do Zach. Then you have the Paulo DeJounte 
like they're going to take it up a whole nother level from where we took it from. So yeah. they're the leaders of the new school, right? And now, Martell Webster was different when he was in high school. Oh. Uh, yo, Aaron Brooks is cold, Aaron too. Aaron Brooks, too. Yeah. I played Brooks with him. Bro, I'm going to mess this list up because we have so many hoopers. Yeah. Aaron Brooks. Rodney Stuckey. Rodney Stuckey. Stuckey. Stuckey was a Spencer proud. Hall. <laughs> Spencer yeah. Hall. Martell Webster. Bro, we have so – Luke Rittenauer. Like, yeah. we have so many hoopers. Like, that's that's a tough, tough list to crack. That's a tough one. That's I never put my <clears throat> never put myself in. I get a spot there, but that's tough. We got a lot of hoop and all guards pretty much besides Spence. Yeah, and now that's, Paolo is a, a a bigger guard, I guess. Well, I think one thing too I want to ask <clears throat> next. Obviously, you're super tight with Isaiah, but um, your journey and never stopping, you know, clearly really set the tone. What advice did you give him, even uh, you know, in the darkest times when he kept trying to push through, and now he's back with the Suns, and you know year you know he's 35 years old now still getting you know an opportunity i always just say good comes to good and he was operate he was operating purely bro like he was up yeah. every single day not knowing and i can relate to that because remember from the Suns to brooklyn i was out 16 months yeah. so i know what that was like every day to work out and not know if it's gonna happen when i got the call bro it felt like a dream even that's what i teach this other day because I was coaching the game, and then I saw the news. It was trending everywhere. I'm like, bro, you know, your emotions are there from coaching the game. And I walked out. I said, it felt like a dream that you got signed. But I just knew it was going to happen because he's too good of a person. Mm-hmm. He's been too good to the game. Like, he's been too good to the game of basketball. And he was working out every single day. So I just felt like it was going to happen. I was so excited for him, and I'm excited for him because – you know IT. You guys know IT. IT just like – he's always smiling. He's always happy. And he just – you want people that love the game that purely to always be able to, to to have their journey the way they want it because they've kind of earned that right. Yeah, uh, that's real. Yeah. Sure. Well, man, I can I, can just, I ask oh, can I ask y'all oh, a couple questions, bro? Who you think? Yeah, yeah. yeah do your sure. thing. Et, what's what's one of your biggest regrets with how your career went? With all the talent for you, what was one of the biggest things you're like, man? If I would have did this, or if I was in this situation here. What was one thing that you like? You look back on like, man, things could have went totally different here. I could have been a multi all star, whatever it was. What was the situation for you? I think I wish I would just, uh, you know, kept, you know, kept my goals at the focal point. Like sometimes by the time I came in, sometimes I would get tired of it. Just like, man, fuck this shit. It's more about. Ba- it's more than just about basketball. Yeah, that could that could break a wheel. That can break. You know, a wheel. That was yeah, just like my point. Like, I think one thing that occurred was just like adjusting goals. And then also adjusting roles everywhere I went. And you know what I mean? And at one point, I was just getting tired of just being you like... got tired oh. of it, yeah. Yeah, just like, all right, cool. So what are you saying? All right, just rebound, go guard the other, you know, team's best player and do this, and a third and shoot four times a night and distribute. And then if anybody else sacrifices me, it was like, that was tough doing that, especially during that time where there was like no real chip in sight. I think if I had to say something, besides that, I guess retiring at 31 might have been too soon. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I was just kind of just like, I just I just got, you know, tired to a certain extent and like begging for my food or even just like begging to show like what my worth was or just being like, yo, what they talking about? Like if, if my worth isn't, you know, viewed in this sense, I'll just do something else with it. But I think that was one thing of just like, uh, you know, not uh, not just getting fed up with the process in a sense. You know, sometimes I went to the point where I was just like, all right, I'll be, perfectly fine just playing in this role or just doing this or trying to help as much as possible but i think at one point i was just like over it you know what i mean I, I didn't really find any real joy like the first four or five years hooping and, and on the flip side if you were the perfect coach for you how would you coach you like what uh, how what would you highlight how would you use et i mean yeah. i would put me in a position to be successful i think one thing when you look at my game i couldn't shoot a three but i could do everything else Literally everything else. Yeah. Right. And like, I'm talking about like, if you talk to Isaiah, we go to practice and stuff. It's like, all right, I'm killing the first team. You said it's your franchise. Okay. Tell him to roll it up and bet me a hundred thousand a bucket. Bet he won't. All right. When you sit down there, throw me into the crunch time. I'm going to hit every big time shot. You know what right. I'm saying? I'm going to dime shit up. So I think when it came down to it, just messing with Brad, you know, I thought he put me in, you know, his best situation to be successful, but I think just ignore the fact that I wasn't, 
shooting 45% from the three and comprehending I can do everything else. I, I think that would have helped a little bit. And, uh, you know, clearly, uh, shit, I, I, I'm big on helping yourself as well. You know what I mean? Right. And go up and, uh, the, the best, the best, uh, thing you can do is be available and be there, you know? And, and, uh, that's all I can really think of. Iggy, for you, what, when did you realize you mastered the game mentally? Like when you were like, damn, I, I'm, I think differently than all these dudes out here. That's a really good question. Yeah. That's because a question. I, I was just thinking, and me and ET speak about this. We were in Philly and this is like, you know, we try, I try not to like speak any, I'm done bashing, you know, certain places, right? Mm-hmm. But ET and I would speak to like the practice facility we had. Like we rented our practice facility from 8 a.m. to like 2 p.m. Okay. And so outside of that, like it, it wasn't a known thing that I can go back in the gym at night and like get up shots or like work on my game. And so mm-hmm. I'm saying all that to say like I had regrets. It's like, why didn't I run into somebody? who would have gave me the proper shooting mechanics. Like I got, I figured it out on my own and it took me, you know, seven, eight years. It's like, all right, if you leave me open, I'm going to make this three and being told like go dunk every single time, you know? So I feel like I like, but I, looking back, all those things were needed because they're roadblocks that I just had to figure my way around. Like I still figured out like be a crazy savant defensively. They can't take you out the game. And That's my real. athleticism, my athleticism, the way I can attack, on the offensive end, like I ain't a liability, you know? So like, that's always how I thought about it. Um, but the one thing I do credit myself was for studying. Like I studied a lot. And so I used to, I would go every summer. It would be like seven guys. Like it was Kobe. It was Bron. It was Mello. It was Joe Johnson. Uh, it was Richard Jefferson. Like, like my position, like the best, right. so like that second tier, and it was probably 45 minute video of all these guys. Paul Pierce was like one of the guys I tried yeah. to idolize because he wasn't the most athletic, but he was always finding a way to get a shot. Or always. Get to the line. Always. Like, yeah, right. It was like he had the greatest pump fake of all time. And so and then uh, Kobe and I had the same agent. So now I'm really asking questions about like, what's he doing every day in the summer? Like, that's how I learned how to train in the summer. Now, in the summertime, I'm training two or three times a day. So wow. I'm get I'm getting my work in in the summer. Getting the work in, right? Right. But and I was speaking to um, what's my guy name in Miami that works guys out? Oh, I'm drawing a blank. He's worked my son yeah, out last um, year. Uh, big I fella, I know his name. The one he's with D Wade sometimes. Yeah, big fella. Oh, I can't yep. believe he's gonna be so what's mad he? at me. He's gonna be Yo, so that's mad at me. So he got the best workouts too. I forgot his name. It's not Basil. John, like, John Wall's with him sometimes too. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. He got everything. <laughs> Tyler Hero. Tyler <laughs> Hero. Man, come on. We gotta get his name. We gotta give him a shout out. No, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Killers. Yes, he does. He's cold at what he does too. Yeah. Oh, we what got, is going on? We gotta on? give him a shout out. Let me see what it is. Cause we sent them to Lil uh, My to son Lil went, Jay. my son went to him. And oh, my you son, Iggy, on no. you. You and my know. son woke up, and like the last when the light switch came on for my son, he went to right. work out. And the first day he got back, and I'm like, "Son, how was it?" And he gave me that look, like, "I don't know." And I'm like, "Listen, it's okay to fail." And he was like, "Man, Dad, the first the first drill, I thought to myself, I ain't cut out for this." And it was the perfect father son moment because I'll never right. forget. Tim Grover, my very first workout with Tim Grover. Tim Grover, it was, the half, it was a half moon drill. And you start that with Grover. You got to make 20. That's the first drill. And you got to go as hard as you can. Fam, I could not. Like, once I got stuck at like eight, then I got stuck at 11. I'm like, I'm never going to get out of this I'm drill. I'm make it. Right. I said to myself, hey, man, go back to college. And so I was able to tell my son this story. Like, listen, I had this happen to me. But when I got over that and I got through that first week and I came back the next week, I'm like, whew, all right. I start building confidence. And the same yes. exact thing happened to for my son, where like the second week, because the first week they're like, we don't know if he ready. I'm talking week two. They're like, yo, he got yo, it. He got, he got it. it. He got it. And then we did three, we did a month down there and they were like, yo, he got a chance from like day one. Like, I don't know if he built for this. To like right. now he in the drills and his mom, you know, my wife is always like, leave him alone, don't force him. She don't really see it ever. 
because right. he didn't really fall in love with it until later. So I'm I'm always like, he got it. He'll be fine. She was like, don't make him play. The the second week, third week of uh, this training, she was like, my baby going to the league. I'm cracking up laughing. Like she was like, he cold. See? See? He cold. I'm like, I told that. you he had she it. She wouldn't just say that. Yo, she would it, never it, say that. She would it, never it, say that. And the trainer is Remy. His name Remy. is Remy. 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 Shout, Remy. Shout, Shout out, out Remy. Shout out Remy. Yeah, yeah, Remy. Absolutely. Yeah, Remy. Remy and, had and, my son on a different and, level. Iggy, my second question, my second question, because I gave ET two. My second question is, if you do decide to coach your son, which one of your coaches that you've had over your career in high school, college, pros, do you think you will steal from in coaching him? Like, as far as, you know, which one of them do you think will? We'll, we'll come to the forefront from what you learn on these guys. I would probably go with well, my the best coach I ever had was Lou Dosen. I give it to Coach O. Um, mm, he great didn't Lou Dosen, right? Yeah, Coach O wasn't the most personable. Like Coach O would be like, if you want to link with me, you got to get on my schedule. So it wasn't like wrapping his oh, arm around wow. you. You know what I'm saying? Like Coach O, but when he got in between them, you know, 94 feet, 50 feet with when he got in those parameters there was no basketball mind like that and he was big on fundamentals and so yeah the first 30 minutes of every practice was so difficult fam and it was all ball handling two ball two ball ball handling one ball and i'm talking Condition, about really, conditioning type ball handling yeah, yeah. And so coach showed had a, a rule we don't do conditioning without a ball so we only had to run if we were on BS. Like we only had to do sprints if it was like, all right, I'm taking away y'all privileges. Like y'all just, Punishment y'all on some running, other right. stuff. You know, he didn't curse. He was like, y'all on some other stuff. I'm putting the balls away. So if we had conditioning, it was three man weave, it was five man weave. Everything was involved with the basketball in our hand. Cause he was like, you're never going to be doing anything on the court without the ball. Why would you do conditioning without the ball? Without it. That makes sense. And so we had pass back machines. And so you, the pass back machine was so important because the ball had to come back to you perfectly. And the only way it could come back to you perfectly is if you place it perfectly on a pass back. So right hand, left hand, we played monkey in the middle, like for real in practice. So, you know, with my son, like he's a great shooter, but what Coach O did, he turned great athletes into great basketball players. And it was all Mm -hmm. based around the fundamentals. Like you couldn't drive baseline ever. You had, we had a no spin rule. So, like, those small things that we didn't understand, like, why can't I spin? When you get to the league, you understand why. Like, I knew shell drill, but I had a 10-year vet that couldn't figure out shell drill. Mm-hmm. So, all those things that I was taught that helped me start as a Rick in the NBA, I had to give all that credit to Coach O. Not even liking him while I was playing for him because <laughs> if you're – But if appreciating you're, him later, though. Well, you're, when you're a freshman and when you're a sophomore, Coach O, he really – he really getting on your nerves on purpose. He's like, I really don't rock with none of y'all until you're a junior, senior. And so I never really got the opportunity. Like I've seen him interact with juniors and seniors. He show them all the love. He let you do your thing, like go crazy. But as a freshman and sophomore, he's just tough on you. And so I didn't realize none of this and I'm immature. But when I got to the league, I'm like, oh, snap. Coach O was elite. Me. Elite. Yeah. 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 That's dope. That's dope. But fam, we really appreciate you pulling up, man. It was just uh, man. Anytime, we had a we had a, we had a fun conversation. Yeah, we had a great conversation. Um, yeah, best of luck, anytime, bro. Best of best of luck in your future endeavors with the league with TNT. You killing it there. Please keep killing it there. Send our love to Candace and Shaq. You know y'all do y'all things on uh, Tuesday Shaq nights. Crazy, so. Yes, Shaq, Shaq crazy. <laughs> Shaq, 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 Shaq live like an emperor, man. Shaq, that's that's my big dog, though. He he's 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 such a great person. Candace is yep. a genius, basketball yep. genius, and left coast with PG. So it's dope. Appreciate yeah, y'all. I'm I'm watching, bro. I'm a subscriber. Yes, sir. Man, I appreciate, I appreciate that, fam. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Best you, of luck tomorrow. to young fella, too. Thank you. You too. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Take care. All right.